going to look into the word of God with the uh, mentality that perhaps sometimes we have had in the past, which is uh, we're going back now into the word of God and we're going to open this up. Oh yes, I've read this before. I'm going to read it again. And you know, I know what this is all about. No, we're going into the word of God this morning with expectation. Am I right? Are we going into the Word of God this morning with expectation? Yes. Yes. Are we going into the Word of God with faith? Yes. Yes. And if we haven't got it, then please, Lord, give us faith and expectation as we go into the Word of God. You see, it's no good me preaching. I could preach in the Word of God all day, but it it won't mean anything. Unless we understand that this is in fact the word of God. This is the parameter of the Christian experience. In terms of, you know, the written Christian experience. And, and if you want to know what the will of God is, it's revealed in the word of God. Am I right? The will of God is revealed in the word of God. So the question is now, what does the word of God say? What does it really say? And so often, you know, i found that what we think it says is different to what it says. And how we've applied the word of God so often through a religious mindset is in fact very different to actually what the word of God says. You know, people came, uh, to, people have asked, you know, how come there's been miracles? How come there's always testimonies of miracles in this church? So, well, it's very simple, really. We, we, we made a decision. I made a decision to not follow my mind. So I submit my mind before him, you see. And in order to do that, I need to let the word of God influence me rather than me influencing it. And very often what happens is people have gone to the word of God and they've read it. And then their past experiences are used as the limits by which they interpret it. So, you know, Jesus says something, or the Word says something, you can faith as big as a mustard seed, can move a mountain, and some clever theologian comes in and says, yes, but you've got to contextualize it. And it takes all the power out of the potential that Jesus is saying to us. Am I right? I really, uh, this is, you know, so with three theological degrees, I decided I'm going to submit my mind to the word of God rather than the word of God being submitted to my mind. And that's where the power of God kicks in. Let's jump then into the word of God, shall we? John 14, verses 16 and 17. I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, and he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth. Whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him, nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you. And will be in you. Being born again involves the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. The Holy Spirit dwells in Christians. (laughs) He dwells in Christians. In the New Testament we can see... That God is for mankind. He's with mankind. But he's also in mankind. The reality is this. That God in us guarantees our success and victory in life. That's the, that's the truth of what the scripture says. The scripture in Romans 8, it says, If God is for us, who can be against us? 
Once we recognize the truth that God is really genuinely for us, we live fearless Christian lives. Nothing can keep us down. We live in victory. And the problem is that sometimes we don't know or understand what that victory should, could or might entail. What it could be. And to understand what we have to do is understand what the scripture says. See, God's will is revealed in his word. So, as Romans 12 says, you know, not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you will prove what is that good, perfect and acceptable will of God. Romans 12 too. A transformation then takes place. There's the old man... The old man who's lived one way for however many years it was before we were born again. And then suddenly we're born again. And as the Bible says in the Greek, a new species is created. But that new species uh, is alive now to God. Born from above, the Spirit of God uh, dwells inside that being. But the mind has to be transformed. It has to be changed. Am I making sense so far? You know, once I didn't know that the power of God existed, I I was unaware that, you know, God uh, really did manifest uh, in Christians and through Christians. I didn't didn't believe that I could lay hands on someone and and see, uh, you know, God heal them, ministry, minister healing to them. I I didn't understand that, I didn't know that. And so what happened? Did I do it? No. Of course I didn't. I didn't know that I could do that. I didn't know that that potential was in me, latent within me as a believer. I was unaware. No one had told me. The religious establishment had very little expectation of what God might do in someone. And so I didn't, you know, I didn't do anything. But once I understood that God was really alive, he's alive, he's in me. (laughs) He lives, and he lives in me, and that power potential is now residing in me. So, what am I going to do with it? Praise God. I'm an ambassador for Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.20, it calls us, you and me, if we are Christians, if we're believers, it calls us ambassadors. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. But the point is, and interestingly, be reconciled to God. And notice that word implore. There's There's an urgency, there's a desire. I want you to be reconciled to God. You know, so when we're living a Christian life and we don't care for people out there, when we just go about our lives, thank you very much, and you know, yeah, it's Sunday, so I'll go to church today. When we live like that, that's not Christianity. No, Christianity is a life with, with a burden to see someone one for Jesus. I want to reach you with the gospel of Jesus. I want your lives to be transformed. I, I, I want you to meet this living Savior. You know, I, I, I'm an ambassador for him now. You are ambassadors. We're ambassadors of the Lord Jesus. I went to an ambassador's house with Micah for breakfast in Geneva. It was very nice. We had a lovely invite when I was speaking in a conference over there. And um, so this ambassador invited us round to his house, you know, for a lovely breakfast. And we had this beautiful um, breakfast there, you know, laid on. And, um, and then they gave us gifts, you know, as ambassadors, they represent the country uh, that they're sent by. And then they were glad to give us gifts from that country. Well, they were representing that country. Well, you and I have been uh, commissioned as ambassadors of his kingdom. And now we've got gifts that we are commissioned to give out to people. What a wicked thing it would have been if that bloke said, you know what, we'll keep all those nice gifts in the cupboard there. Don't give them anything. We'll just save them all up for you and me. What a silly man he'd be, wouldn't he? Well, what gifts have you got latent in you? Are 
Are you doing the same thing with spiritual gifts? With a word of encouragement? With someone that needs prayer? Someone who needs to hear the gospel of Jesus? <laughs> Makes me think of that friend, you know. Uh, the policeman, you know, who's, who stands on the... Uh, on the street corner like this, you know, and he just stands there like this, looking very sheepish, a policeman, dressed in his uniform, looking sheepish like this. And you go over to him and you say, oh, what's the matter, officer? You look a bit strange to see an officer of the law looking like this. The sergeant's told me to direct the traffic today, but I don't think they're going to listen. Oh, what, what makes you think they're not going to listen to you? You big baby. <laughs> no, you wouldn't say that, would you? But, you know, well, I, just, I just don't feel like it. I just don't, I don't know, I just, I just got a feeling, you know. Be deadly to be run by feelings, wouldn't it? And emotions. I mean, just imagine if a police officer ran his life by feelings and emotions. You say, listen, it's not about your feelings, nice policeman. It's, it's about the law of the land. You've been authorized to direct the traffic. You have every authority to direct this traffic. It's your job. It's your role. Don't, you know, you can be confident in going ahead and doing it. So, do you really think so? Well, it's not about what I think. It's, I, I know that that's the case. But that's what it, you know, if your sergeant has commissioned you to go out and do that job, go and do it. Now then, we've been commissioned as ambassadors, haven't we? You know, I mean, we've been commissioned as ambassadors. We've got to go, we've got to go ahead and do it. We've been given... Work to do, responsibility. To represent the kingdom of God. And I love what it says, you know, in Hebrews, it says, He is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. In the old covenant, God was for Israel, He was with Israel, but He wasn't in Israel as he's in you and me. Abraham was called a friend of God. We're in the family. <laughs> you know. I mean Mark is very good. Mark helps me out with bits and pieces. You know. And I have this fawn that I have. Mark in the back there. I have this fawn. You know. To me it's just a fawn. You know. They, yeah, I'm not interested in the thing. And it's a phone, and I give him the phone. He says, oh, he says, oh, it's an iPhone 4. It's the da -da -da S model. It's the, it does, oh, now, do you want to see what it does? It does this, this, and this, and this. I think, wow, he can control the TV with the phone. He's controlling all sorts of things with it. I mean, there's maps coming up. There's all sorts of things. There's a, he's telling me how much miles per gallon my car's doing by the phone. There's all sorts of things that he's finding out about it. Why? He's, fa he's taken the time to find out the potential that's latent within that device. You know, I hadn't taken the time to find out what the potential was. Well, listen, God has put his resources in you and I. He dwells in you and I. And latent within us are all these wonderful gifts and resources. And he's saying to us, listen, use them. I've commissioned you to use them. I'm calling you ambassadors. I've written it in black and white. It's in my word. It's not the theory of this preacher. It's in black and white. You can refer to it on your own, you know. It's, it, it, that's what it says. I mean, in the old covenant, you know, those people, I think of those men, they had to go at least once a year, you know, to Jerusalem. At least once a year they had to go. And, and then... 
they'd go and, you know, they wouldn't be able to enter, of course, the Holy of Holies. That was just for the priests on the Day of Atonement. And the priests would go in. But then Jesus, on the cross, our beautiful Savior, on the cross, he dies, he dies that we could be washed in his blood, cleansed of our sin, if we put our faith in him. And he says on the cross, it's finished. It's finished, he says. And he's referring to the old covenant there as well. The old covenant was finished at that point. And do you know what the proof is for that? The veil around the temple, the Holy of Holies, was torn in two. That thing was about 40 feet wide, 20 feet high, and the Jewish historians say four inches thick. And as you know, it says in the scripture that it was torn in two from the top to the bottom. Ripped from the top to the bottom, signifying that it wasn't a man who did it, it was God. He ripped that thing in two, and now all of a sudden, everyone that believes in Jesus, the Lamb of God, doesn't just have access to the Holy of Holies, but becomes the habitation. Of the Holy of Holies. God lives. In you. And me. He really does. He lives in us. I believe we need to develop an awareness. Of God living in us. You know I went to a pastor's meeting. This is so fundamental to what I believe. I couldn't go back. Because they spent all the meetings, you know, oh, we want more power, we want more power. We're, you know, begging and calling for God for more power. And, you know, all oh, I'm thinking, no, 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 no. On the cross, he said, it's finished. He's given us every bit of power that we'll ever need. Everything that we'd ever desire or need, we have access to that through his finished work on the cross. It's not a question of, uh, you know, him giving more power. It's a question of us using the power that he's given. Acts 1 verse 8 says, you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Power for what? To be witnesses. And that entails, you know, the supernatural. You know, it's like... (laughs) It's like that little man, Jimmy. My friend, Martin Newman, the Irishman, who's a dear friend of mine. And uh, his friend, little Jimmy, he used to sell the uh, Evening Standard newspaper in London. He's only about four foot ten inches tall. And he used to take him to um, Blake's Hotel in South Kensington. And he used to go down there for a nice coffee in the afternoon. I went once. Paid about 50 quid for him. <laughs> he used to go down there, and, he used to, and, and this one day they went down there, and uh, he was down there, and they were in this certain lounge area that they uh, could, uh, could have access to. And in there was Gloria Gaynor, the singer Gloria Gaynor. And um, the chap from Led Zeppelin. The singer. And little Jimmy, who sold the evening standard on the street corner. But Jimmy played the spoons. And Martin said to him, Now listen now, Jimmy. Go ahead, Jimmy. They absolutely love it. Go and play the, play the, the spoons. I'll get him done. Gloria, would you like to help little Jimmy out? He just sing the Our Father. If you'd sing the Our Father. And oh, hello there. What's your name? What's, what's your name? Oh, you, and you're a singer as well. Oh, it's Chris Grant. You help out. You sing this. You sing it. He said, Stevie, it was great. I had the man there from Led Zeppelin, Gloria Gaynor, and Dudley Moore and his wife. They were there as well. And they're all singing the Our Father, and little Jimmy is playing the spoons. 
just like this. He said he was absolutely brilliant. Plays it on his arm like this, on his shoulder, plays it on the back and on his head. Stevie, he was absolutely brilliant. And they're all singing around. Great time was had by all. It's tremendous. At the end of it, Dudley Moore says to him, where do you, where do you live? He said, well, he said, I live in one of the parks there. He just dig a little hole at the end of the day, you know, fill it with a bit of newspaper, cover it with leaves, and, you know, spend the night there. Have a little bath in the YMCA there, you know. He said, you're coming back with us, he said. I've got a lovely mansion in Buckinghamshire. You're coming back with us. He said, Stevie, the last thing I saw was little Jimmy at the back of the rolls. He could barely see you over. His little hand was waving goodbye to me like this. He said, it was a great day. He said, oh, it was grand, he said. It was great. It was great. He said, he went down there to that house. Goes in there. He says to his butler, he says, uh, this is my dear friend Jimmy. Give him the guest suite and anything he wants. So the morning comes. And there's a knock on Dudley Moore's door. And he says, um, he says, the butler, Mr. Moore, Mr. Moore, uh, I, I can't find your friend, he's disappeared. Oh. They come in, they go and look for him in the bedroom. So there's a four post of bed. So they have a look on top of the bed. They have a look underneath the bed. Then they go into the bathroom. They look into the bathroom. Then they start looking in the cupboards. Dudley Moore's wife goes and pulls the curtain. And as she pulls the curtain, she looks in the garden. She sees he's, he's, he's dug a hole for himself and he's sleeping in the garden. <coughs> what a frustrating thing to do. He'd been given this beautiful suite. But he's dug a hole for himself. He's crept out in the night. He hasn't had any of the food on offer or anything at all. He's just dug a hole and he's sleeping out there in the garden what a silly man they couldn't believe it so they got him in and they came. but the point is this little Jimmy did what he was most comfortable with what he was used to Even though he had been offered the best the world has to offer, he refused that and stuck with what was comfortable. Thank you very much. And that is exactly what Christians do. We can see it with Jimmy. We think, what a silly thing. If I was in that position, I'd, be, I'd enjoy the luxury. But actually, we do exactly the same thing in the spiritual God has given us great resources, great promises. Not a, this isn't a great mystery, you know, that we have to uncover. There's no, I'm not giving any particular great revelation here. This is all plain, straightforward Bible Christianity. But the thing is, you know, it's our choice now to appropriate and say, yes, that life is for me. I'm a son of the king. What does it mean to, have, to, to be in the kingdom? Romans 5.17 says we should reign in life through one Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Kingdom life. You know, kingdom is made up of two words. The king who has dominion. We are ambassadors of the kingdom who has dominion. You know, if... if Worldly ambassadors have a certain amount of power. How much power do we have? Ambassadors of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, of His kingdom on planet Earth. I believe God has a great plan for us. We start, we start off rooted and grounded. He'll grow what He's going to grow. I believe He's going to grow something. And I believe it'll be very significant. I really do. Because I believe that, you know, when you look around, there are precious little Christians who have decided to take up this mantle and live this life, live this way. No one's interested in religion. I'm certainly not. The religion of Christianity, I can't think of anything more boring. 
I like the taking on from the ambassador analogy, just as I close here. You know, it says in 2 Timothy 2, 4, when I grew up, you know, it was like growing up in the army. I didn't go to the army, but it was like growing up in the army. I had, uh, my father was, was brought up by his grandfather, who was a, as a sergeant in the British Army, British Army boxing champion. I, I look at the scripture, it says in 2 Timothy 2, 4, no one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. You see, it's not about us deciding, oh yes, yes, now this all, you know. No, it's not about us being good little Christians and going this way. Hey, we're in an army. He's a commanding officer. You know, it's the policeman again. Go back to him. You know, if his sergeant came up or if he's, let's say he's a soldier. He's a soldier now and the sergeant has told him, you know, go off and and do this certain job. He said, well, you know, I'd, I'd like to, but I... You know, first of all, I'm just going to, you know, I've just got, I've got a few other bits and pieces. I'll try and get to it later. Oh, (laughs) that's not going to work out, is it? You've been in the army, haven't you? And David, you've been, (laughs) it's not going to work out very well for him if he takes that approach. He say, yes, yes. When I was a boy, you know, dad says, yes, sir. Jump to it. You know. Yes, sir. So uh, that's the approach that Paul is conveying as he writes to us. He says, listen, this is like being in the army. This is a spiritual army. Your duty is to jump to it. Yes, sir. Go out. I've got, you've got a gift in this area. Now you go out and use that gift. You've been deputized, authorized. You're an ambassador. Go, he says. He doesn't say go to good little Christians. He says go to all Christians. Now, if we're in his arm, we're either in or we're out. If we're in, we've got to jump. When he says go, we go and do it. Otherwise, we're not in. So he says go. Now, if I went around the churches in Britain today, and I said, right, I'm doing a survey. Pastors, I'm going to get all the pastors together. I've got a survey that we're doing. I want to find out, you know, some, some points. First of all, I want to find out, do you believe... Uh, in the laying on of hands. And, and he goes, well, you know, we'd get down to about 80% quite quickly, wouldn't we? Uh, 80% not believing that. 20% would, <laughs> would believe it probably. 20% might say yes. That's my guess. Do you believe? Do you believe in speaking in tongues? Well, then we'd probably get down to probably 5%, I, I think. I don't know. Maybe 5%. Do you believe in casting out demons? Well, now we're down to about 2%, probably. Well, you see, Mark 16 makes it very clear that those signs will follow them that believe. So I ask myself the question, well, you know, if, if those signs aren't even expected in the church, we're not talking about the world, we're talking about the church. Not even the church is expecting those things. If 2% of the church is expecting those things, it's no wonder that the grid has been taken out of Britain. Amen. And the country is going down quick. Because men and women, instead of standing up for the gospel of Jesus, living this gospel life, and living with their fanciful ideas, and the religious establishment, which frankly is Wrong. (laughs) But you know the beauty, and I'll finish with this. I'm going to finish with this. The beauty for me is this. When we live this life, and when we've decided, I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm going to spend my life living for you, Lord. And if there's things in my life that need to change, change me, Savior. I give you my life. We make that decision. Life becomes an adventure. It's beautiful. You know, I, I just reflecting the other day, and I mentioned it to someone. I can remember, uh, right as I close, in Ealing Common, when I lived in, in, in London. And it was late at night, and it was the last tube, and there had been problems with the tube. And I was caught the last one, and I caught the back of the train. 
and I was the, right at the, I had to walk the platform to get to the steps. I got out of the train, and immediately the platform's empty. It's the last train, and there's f- five youths, and they s- shouted some abuse at me. And they were only just about, you know, from there, there to just a few feet away. And they shouted abuse. I was really shocked. Nasty. At me. And they looked, you know, like they were in for trouble. So I, so I walked quickly away. You know, I walked on the platform. And as I walked on the platform, I was saying, Lord, thank you for your help and your protection. Thank you, Lord, that you protect me, you help me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Keep me safe, Lord. Thank you that Jesus, great is he that lives in me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Just go up. And I went up the steps. I couldn't hear any footsteps behind me. I was oh, so relieved. No footsteps behind me. And I got up to the top of the steps. And I walked by the ticket master. No ticket master there. I had a look behind. No one behind me. Great. Put my ticket in. Walked on the street with a song and a spring in my step. And the Lord says to me as I'm walking down the street, singing praises to him, go back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That can't be from the Lord, surely. He, you know, it was. Because you, you just know, you know when it's from, the, you just have that, the Lord just, you know. And I knew it was from him, and I said, oh, all right, Lord, just help me. Help me, Lord, please help me. So I walk all the way back, and you can see them, like, as I'm walking down this platform, and they're looking, thinking, what on earth is this bloke doing coming back? You know. I felt like if, I felt like one of those spaghetti westerns, you know. <laughs> and and, and I, was, I walked back, and and I walked up, and I, you know, I didn't know, I didn't know what I was going to say. I didn't know what I was. Gonna, I just knew that I had to follow what the Lord had told me to do and walk back. So I, I walked up to them. As I got, you know, a few feet away, I said to one of them, I said, "Now you." I said, you're a tough man in your group here, but late at night when there's no one else around, you cry yourself to sleep at night on your pillow, crying and weeping. You, you play the keyboards and your mother goes to church and she's been praying for you and she's been trying to get you to go back to church. And you should see them. <laughs> Uh, they were absolutely, it was, they turned from being these nasty thugs who I thought were going to stab me or something into little boys. And their heads down like this. And I said, it's all right. I said, he forgives. I said, we've all done things wrong. And I was able to just help them then, you know, and tell them, I know this because God is real. God is alive. You know, that's the interesting thing as well. When God gives you a gift, and when God uses you in a way, always be very quick to point to him. You know. The human heart is deceptive and wicked above all else, above all things. And it'll jump quick to get the attention and, you know, want to be, you know, the focus. So I said, no, 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 no. I'm not going on that road. Give him all the praise. So I pointed him to him. He's the one that's done this. And he's doing it because he wants to speak to you. Praise God. Amen. Well, we praise God. We thank him. He has given us an opportunity then. And uh, he's given us an opportunity to, to recognize that God lives in us. And God wants to use us. The decision is this. Will we conform ourselves to his will as it's revealed in his word. Let's stand together, shall we?